to recap on what we said before, let's just look at this comparative slide on how the focus of religious art changed in the Romanesque period towards the Gothic. So you can see in the Romanesque on the left-hand side, there is an emphasis on life after death, definitely whether you're condemned to eternal damnation or whether you will join the heavenly realm, and also the focus on purgatory. And women have been depicted as the seductress, as the portal to sin, and Satan is usually depicted as a hybrid of some kind of woman, or sometimes an animal and a woman, when Satan is depicted as the snake in the Garden of Eden. It's usually a hybrid species of snake or female snake. Also, book production was exclusively in the monasteries by monks, and the Bible was seen as the major source of information and knowledge. And comparatively to the Gothic era, a shift occurred, there was more of emphasis on salvation, and we see female representation that Mary gets receives more representation as this great mother, as this redeemer, as a sort of intervener. There is that dedication to romantic love. We have books and the production of books now by, by secular sources as well, and for a secular market as well. There is an emphasis on the intellectual with the book of Aquinas, and also the various philosophies of humanism. Let's consider these mosaics in comparison to Gothic stained glass windows. So from the various periods that we've looked at thus far, the early Christian era, where Jesus Christ is depicted as the good shepherd, as this young, youthful, human man and he is the herder of this flock of sheep he is a source of solace and of security then when we look at the byzantine era where there was the emphasis on jesus christ as the pantocrator as the ruler of the universe as the supreme ruler as in, in complete control of everything that occurs. And suddenly in the Gothic era, what do you see? Jesus Christ is now depicted as a baby, a helpless child, and being protected by the Virgin, or by Mary. So he is on her lap, and as I've mentioned before, he is seated on the throne of wisdom, which was another term given to Mary. So suddenly, there's a complete shift in how Jesus Christ is depicted during the Gothic era. Let's look at the Reims Cathedral, which is a great example from Cathedral of the High Gothic Era. It was built from around 1225 to 1290. The King's Gallery above the rose window is notable. The openings are taller, narrower, and more intricate. They wanted to dematerialize the building as though when you entered the building, you you didn't even know there was any stone involved in making the building or providing structure for the building. And glass replaces the stone in the tympanums. Here you can see a close-up of the King's Gallery above the rose window. The development of Gothic architecture can clearly be seen in these notable cathedrals. So on the left hand side we have Chartres, which we've looked at, and look at the tripartite 
organization. And especially if you start to look at the rose windows. So look at Amiens, the rose windows starting to use a lot more glass and the stone is becoming less and less and the portals become more intricate. So the decoration becomes more illuminated. You start to see the King's Gallery and then on the rims on the right, it's even a more heightened sense of decoration and opulence. When we look at the Western facades, jam statues, the visitation jam statues, as you can see depicted here, there's a classical naturalistic style when you look at their faces and when you look at the clothing, the drapery that they wore, and also their bodies are twisted towards another figure. So it seems as though they are conversing with each other. They are completely detached now from the column. They're full-bodied. They're not yet freestanding. In this depiction, you can clearly see the different allocations. So the jam figures that we've just looked at. As we've mentioned in the beginning, the Gothic style really became an international style and it became adopted across other countries in Europe. It began around 1375. It's a courtly decorative style. There is an emphasis on elegance, delicate detail, soft facial expressions and smooth forms. Notable patrons of the style is the Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV in Prague, the Valois King of France, and the Visconti of Milan. They all vied for the best artists. And the portability of art made it possible for works to have more international influence. And as I've also mentioned, that later Gothic art developments in architecture are the rayonant and the flamboyant. And in painting, we see the Italian Sienese school and the international Gothic style. The rayonant style, the name of the style comes from the radiating rays of light that come through the windows. They emphasize repetitive decorative motifs a smaller, more human-scaled building, and a plethora of stained glass. The era is from roughly around 1240 to 1350. An example of the rayonant style is the Saint-Chapelle that was built between 1242 to 1248, and it was commissioned by King Louis IX. It is a symbol of royal prestige. It was intended to host the many relics of the king, including the crown of thorns. It has 15 large windows. It has again that emphasis on the vertical and it appears light. It nearly has no walls, stained glass images, and it has thin golden ribs on the inside. It was designed by Pierre de Montreal. When you look at the stonework and the sculpture from the Saint-Chapelle, you can see this naturalism. In this building, most of the figures have become nearly three-standing. They're not relief anymore. And the light. When you enter the cathedral, it's actually not a cathedral because it's a small, that's why it's a chapel. It's actually a chapel. It's a small church intended only for the royal family. 
that when you enter this chapel, you just are in awe because you're surrounded by stained glass windows. And it's as though there's nearly no walls at all, except these thin golden ribs that hold everything in place. When you look at this diagram of the themes of the stained glass windows of Saint-Chapelle, you can see it covers the whole Bible in glass. It begins when you enter through the rose window on your left-hand side with the creation story of Adam and Eve, Noah and Jacob. Then it follows to the Exodus story with Joseph, and then a third, the third group is the covers the Pentateuch with Levi and with Moses receiving the law. Then follows Deuteronomy with and Joshua and Ruth and Boaz's story. Then follows the era of the judges when we reach the Apses. Then it becomes Isaiah and the tree of Jesse, John the Evangelist and his life, the life of Mary and the childhood of Christ. And then in the center of the apse and in the complete opposite of the rose window as you entered. So what you see from afar is Christ's passion then is the scenes of John the Baptist and scenes from Daniel's life, Daniel from the Old Testament. Then follows the prophecies of Ezekiel. And then also still in the apps, tales from Jeremiah and Tobias. Then on the opposite side, on the right hand side, you see number 12, scenes from Judith and the life of Job. And then the depiction of the life of Esther, also from the Old Testament. And number 14, you see depictions from the life of Samuel, David, and Solomon from the Old Testament. And then just as you enter on your right-hand side in this diagram depicted as number 15, you see depictions of the legend of the true cross and the discovery of the cross and how the relics were acquired by Louis the Ninth and the consecration actually of the chapel. So it, all those windows contain the history of the relics and the history of the chapel and how the chapel came to be. Where there isn't stained glass window, there is gold. Gold, gold, gold is everywhere. And the fleur de lis, which is the symbol of the king, is also brought into the decoration in the interior of the church, from the walls and the pillars to the floor. Then looking at the flamboyant style, it started around 1350 to 1550. And the name of the style comes from the French word flambe, meaning flame, as the curving ornate lines of edifices were thought to resemble flames. It emphasized even greater decorative effects by employing more curved shapes. A great example is the western facade of the Church of St. Maclou in Rouen.
more close-up views of the western facade of St. Maclou and also the main portal depicting the Last Judgment. Then let's look at some painting from the late Gothic era. The Italian Zionese school had great influence across Europe. It started around 1250 until the 1500s, or just the turn of the century. The Franciscan and Dominican friars were influenced by humanist ideals, and they developed this style. The school was started by Coppo di Marco Valdu and Guido da Siena in 1250. An early leader of the school or influencer was Duccio, and some call him the father of Siamese painting. His artwork is notable for the Byzantine gold backgrounds and religious iconography, and a new interest in modeling the human form. He painted primarily in tempera on wood. His works included delicate details, elements of human emotion, and architectural settings, while also conveying an elegant otherworldly effect as seen in his Rukelai Madonna. A noted teacher, Daccio trained and influenced Simone Martini, a subsequent leading painter of the Siamese school, as well as the brothers Pietro and Ambrogio Lorenzetti. Martini's works, employing an elegant sense of line and refined decorative effect, is as seen in his Maesta of 1350. So from the Sienese school, Lorenzetti's deposition of Christ from the cross from around 1310 to 1329. What is notable about the Sienese is the human aspect or the humanity of them. And you can clearly see it in the facial expressions of, of the various figures being depicted. They aren't icons anymore. They aren't abstract concepts from the Bible. They are depicted as human beings who really existed with real emotions and real feeling of things that occurred in the scene. This is a depiction of the Last Supper by Pietro Lorenzetti. A depiction by Pietro Lorenzetti, Madonna with angels between St. Nicholas and the prophet Elijah. The figure of peace in allegory of good government. Here she is personified as a woman and she is resting. Her armor underneath the cushion she rests on. She took it off since peace reigns in the city. Another close up of the dances in the effects of good government. And a close-up 
of justice in the allegory of good government. The allegory of good government is one of the fresco groups that aren't religious in subject matter, but conveys a moral theme. This is from the adjacent wall, the effects of good government in the city. And adjacent to it, next to it, the effects of good government in the countryside. And then on the opposite wall is the allegory of bad government. This fresco is also in the Salon of Nine or in the Salai de Nove from 1338 to 39. And you can clearly see the tyrant depicted in the center. I'm showing you a close up of various aspects of the fresco. So, on the top left, the close up detail of the tyrant with fangs and horns. And you can see during bad government. This detail on the left of a woman that's captured, another woman that's lying wounded on the ground. We see that buildings fall apart, they're derelict. We see even in the country that houses are burning and the land is left decimated. And we see peace is bound up and she's not the ruler because the tyrant is in control. Illuminated manuscripts during the Gothic era became the most beautiful objects. And the skill used in these manuscripts is of the highest quality. A wonderful example is Jean Poussel's Belleville Breviary from 1326 and his acclaimed Horse of Jean de Vreux of 1324. It exemplified the style of the late Gothic. Roussel's naturalistic treatment included three dimensional space, sculptural modeling of the human figure, and precisely observed details. Each page from the Belleville Breviary was a page to ponder, to look at, and to discover new meaning that the text alone could not do. This is a border detail from the page of the Belleville Breviary. During the late Gothic, the Book of Hours also became a popular illuminated manuscript. This was not a copy of just the Bible, but it was a small prayer book. It contained examples of prayers. It contained some scriptural pieces, especially from the Book of Psalms. And then it contained other information which varied from Book of Hours to Book of Hours. Its size was also quite small and it was intended to not be owned by a church or a cathedral, but to be owned by a wealthy individual. It was a book that they would carry around and use in their personal prayer and reading time. A great example of a book of hours is the 
Limburg Brothers' Les Très Riches Heures du Duc de Berry from 1412 to 1416. It contained a vivid color palette and realistic scenes of ordinary life that marked the Très Riche Heure, or the Book of Hours, as celebrating secular life as much as fulfilling a religious purpose. Let's look at some of the pages from Les Très Riches Heures du Duc du Berry, which is just French for the Book of Hours of the Duke of Berry. Folio 147, the verso, is a depiction of Judas where he hanged himself. Judas from the Bible who betrayed the trust of Jesus Christ and showed great sorrow after Christ was crucified. Folio 199 verso shows the depiction of a contemporary funeral service. Folio 168 verso is a depiction from one of the miracles of Jesus Christ as he is feeding the multitude. Folio 171 recto is another depiction from the New Testament, another miracle of Jesus Christ, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Folio 164 recto is another depiction of a miracle from the New Testament, the miracle of the Canaanite woman. And what's interesting about this page is that the brothers on a single page, they depicted the span of time. So you can see inside the house, there is a woman attending to an ill person lying on the bed and the Canaanite woman coming to plead with Jesus. And a second scene, a smaller second scene at the bottom, as she's thanking Jesus for the miracle. Folio 143 recto is the scene where Christ was led to judgment. Folio 86 verso is a depiction of the funeral of Raymond Diucre, which is another contemporary. So this is not from the Bible. And this folio depicts the martyrdom of St. Mark in Alexandria. Mark was one of the apostles of Christ, but his death was not accounted in the Bible. So this is a depiction from a later account. The Book of Hours, or the Lettre Richeur, also contained pages and content of other material, of secular material. One of those themes was the calendar. And here you can see the depiction of January. And there's a portrait of the Duke of Berry as he's seated at the table in that beautiful lapis lazuli blue garment. The depiction of May shows the Hotel de Nesle from the Duke, from his Paris residence in the background. 
and in the June page, we see the Palais de la Cité, and we see the Saint Chapelle depicted in the right. Another theme that is more secular in content is the anatomical zodiac man. And then other themes that were popular were themes of purgatory and themes of hell, such as folio 108 recto, which depicts Lucifer or Satan as he's torturing souls as well as being tortured himself in hell. Thank you for joining me for this exciting lecture on Gothic era art and architecture. I hope it piqued your interest and it will encourage you to look at more artwork from this era. See you in the next class. Bye.